morning. My name is John Gitongo, publisher of The Elephant. And this morning, I'm very pleased uh, to be speaking to Professor Elisio Makamo, who is originally from Mozambique. Uh, he's a sociologist by training, and he's now professor of African studies at the University of Basel in Switzerland. And uh, we're really glad to, to be able to speak to, uh, to you this morning, uh, Professor. Uh, and well, it's one of the benefits of, of lockdown <laughs> that we are able to find people like you. <laughs> uh, see, unfortunately, trapped in one place. But let me start by asking, you know, uh, okay, you're from Mozambique, but you're now based in Switzerland. Um, can you maybe give us a little? You know, how, how are you doing? How's how's um, how's how's life? How has lockdown impacted you? Yeah. Uh, Okay, so l let me start by thanking you for giving me the opportunity uh, to appear here and uh, talk to you about uh, uh, such an important uh, topic. I'm doing fine. Uh, Switzerland has been in lockdown uh, for uh, almost uh, six weeks, but uh, um, the authorities have now started uh, lifting the lockdown and uh, it looks as though uh, things will go according to plan, uh, which is uh, to make sure that by June, uh, everything is back uh, to normal, as far as uh, you know, one can call that situation a normal uh, one. So I'm fine, uh, the family is fine, and uh, it's, not, it's not easy, uh, of course, uh, but uh, at least uh, the lockdown here in Switzerland was not as severe as, uh, uh, as it was, for example, in France. Uh, so I could uh, uh, go to university mm -hmm. and uh, I could work in my office at university. The only thing that I could not do was to teach, uh, you know, um, in classrooms. So we do that online just uh, you know like everyone is doing uh, that but otherwise everything else is fine great thank you and and how and what about mozambique how's you i'm sure you still have family in mozambique um, yes and you know how has the pandemic played out in in mozambique yes well the the pandemic is uh, under control uh, in mozambique the the government was quick to react it did not underestimate the situation, you know, like uh, we saw in the US or, or like we see in Brazil uh, now. So it was very quick to react and uh, uh, because the way it reacted uh, was basically consistent with uh, the way in which other countries are reacting. So basically imposing a, 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 um, some kind of lockdown down. Because of that, it had uh, to um, to declare a state of emergency. Uh, but uh, the figures uh, um, are okay. I mean, we we've got about uh, eighty uh, cases. Uh, of course, this uh, doesn't uh, tell us much about the extent uh, of uh, the um, the pandemic in Mozambique, uh, because the ability to test is quite low. So it's not like uh, many people are being tested. Uh, these are really targeted uh, 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 testing uh, measures. So basically people who are known to have traveled abroad, uh, who have been in contact with uh, people who traveled abroad. Uh, and in fact, what made the figures uh, uh, rise uh, in Mozambique uh, was, a very, uh, very peculiar uh, uh, thing. In the north of the country, uh, there are multinationals. So there's a French multinational total uh, that's in the gas and oil field. And uh, so there were people there, so, uh, French uh, people who were infected and who, of course, infected other people. So there was a, a dramatic rise uh, uh, there. Uh, on account of that particular uh, 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 detail, that particular thing. 
but otherwise uh, uh, things are uh, things are okay and uh, i mean we have to see how it evolves uh, uh, but uh, for the time being there doesn't seem to be any reason uh, to fear for the worst <clears throat> Thank, th th thanks. Um, um, your most recent work, uh, Prof, is is the taming of fate, uh, approaching risk from a social action perspective, um, which was published in 2017 uh, by by Codesia. And uh, just the title of the subject, uh, I haven't had a chance to read the book, but uh, I read some some reviews, um, and this is you know the issue of uh, coronavirus. Uh, the, the issue of this pandemic is straight down your alley in a sense in terms of, <laughs> of, of what of what you've been studying. And mm -hmm. so I'll just ask you a very general question to start with. Um, how uh, I mean, I, I was particularly if, you know taken by um, a comment I saw attributed to to you in that book um, that uh, the, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the mm -hmm. extreme situations with apparent destructive potential can actually produce uh, meaningful uh, uh, individual and, and social lives. And um, I'll be keen for you just to maybe tell us a bit about uh, the theory behind uh, yeah. the book of yours as it affects Africa and Mozambique, yeah. and and what lessons this this um, pandemic is teaching us, given your theoretical framework. Okay, so there are several things I should uh, uh, say uh, here. Uh, the first one is that uh, this particular book uh, is uh, the result uh, of research uh, which I conducted uh, within a very broad uh, framework. And that framework was uh, a debate uh, that uh, uh, was going on at the time uh, that I did the research. So I basically, uh, I, I conducted my research in Mozambique uh, from 2001 uh, to 2006. Uh, and so this was uh, uh, a time when in sociology in particular, but also in a field that is broadly known as uh, science and technology studies, uh, there was a, an assumption uh, or even a thesis that was put forward by scholars in Europe and in, in North America, uh, according to which uh, risk, the concept of risk uh, is one that is a particular uh, to uh, technologically advanced societies. So uh, societies which are not technologically advanced uh, are not aware of the notion of risk. They basically live uh, in uncertainty, right? Uh, so uh, Germany uh, is a risk society, but uh, Mozambique is not a risk society on account of the fact uh, that it is uh, technologically uh, not uh, advanced. Uh, so I was uh, not very happy uh, with this way of uh, uh, putting things. And uh, I did my research actually to inquire into local notions of risk. If there are any uh, notions of risk uh, uh, that are observed, that are produced by people uh, in Mozambique. And so in order to do that, I had to conduct uh, research uh, into extreme situations uh, because uh, my assumption was uh, that if uh, I am going to find risk in anything, it will have to be in an extreme situation. So how people uh, deal with extreme uh, situations. The problem with that was uh, that uh, my definition of what an extreme situation was did not coincide uh, with uh, the local definition of that. So just to give you an example, uh, when I first went to the field, I decided that uh, I would not put words into uh, the mouths of my informants. So I will actually try uh, and uh, derive uh, the definition of risk uh, from them. And so what I did was, uh, uh, because I had decided that I would uh, uh, do my research uh, on uh, the uh, 
the floods that had taken place in Mozambique in the year 2000, uh, which right. were, uh, were, were, you know, uh, were the subject of uh, news uh, all over the world. Uh, so I started the research in 2001. And so I went to a, a city that was uh, badly hit uh, by uh, the, the floods, the city where I actually was born and, and, and grew up. So the city of Shai Shai in southern Mozambique, 200 kilometers north of Maputo, the capital city of Mozambique. And so, uh, so when I arrived there, I asked uh, 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 people uh, if anything extraordinary had happened uh, in recent times, because uh, I thought, well, this is perhaps the way I will come to their understanding of uh, what an extreme situation is, uh, and then take things up from there. Uh, and so they looked at me with a blank face uh, and uh, I insisted and then they said, well, what do you mean an extraordinary thing? And I said, well, uh, you know, whatever, uh, anything that uh, perhaps affects your lives in, in any particular way, uh, just anything that you think uh, was extraordinary. And, and I said, when? And uh, uh, I said, well, uh, you know, just may, maybe take the past uh, uh, two, three years and, and so on. And then they said, well, the only thing really extraordinary that happened here uh, was uh, a whale uh, that got stranded uh, uh, at the beach. Oh. Uh, yes, and uh, gave meat uh, to us for weeks, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and I found that interesting because uh, the floods, uh, which had been so severe, which had taken lives and uh, which, uh, you know, had mobilized the whole international community, were not the first thing that came to their mind. That is most, most, most interesting. I remember reading about that very distinctly. Yes. And, um, um, and people living up in trees uh, because of the high yes. level of water for some time giving yes. having you know women giving birth there yes. uh, it, was, it was it was a very dramatic calamity in the international media yes the, in 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 uh, uh, in Shai Shai, it was different, then. and that's the. It, it was it was different, yeah, and and that was interesting, and and that was actually telling, uh, because uh, that is the thing that actually took me uh, straight uh, into, uh, if you like, a, a critical engagement with the notion of risk, because uh, what turned out uh, was that uh, uh, you know, and this is what they would tell me then later. Uh, was that uh, uh, for them uh, a flood uh, is a, is an ordinary event? I mean, they're used to it. This is something that happens all the time, and uh, they also said, you know, a flood is like a guest uh, who comes for three or four days and then he goes away, uh, right? And and then the good thing about the flood uh, is that uh, we then have a good harvest uh, uh, afterwards. Now, the thing that happened in Mozambique was that after, uh, after this flood, uh, these floods in, two, in the year 2000, uh, um, the soil for some reason, and, and I think it's connected to uh, the, uh, you know, to fertilize the warehouses, uh, which uh, were, uh, were, 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 were um, uh, swept uh, by the water. And so uh, they actually destroyed the soils. Uh -huh. And so afterwards, uh, people were not able uh, to really till the land uh, and uh, uh, have a good harvest uh, uh, from that. And so uh, what happened was then uh, that the floods uh, became a disaster in retrospect, uh, right? Mm -hmm. So when the waters were there, uh, you know, people took that as a normal thing. Uh, and they said, you know, uh, this is something that comes and goes. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are used to it. We will lose a few people, but this is the way things are. Uh, um, uh, but, uh, you know, the waters receded and there was no good harvest. They were not able to work and there was no one to help them. And so uh, the floods became uh, 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 a problem, a disaster uh, in retrospect. Now, this is interesting uh, uh, 
because uh, you know it draws attention uh, to how uh, uh, a risk is uh, basically locally defined uh, you know and you define a risk uh, i mean a risk is not something uh, that comes to you already as a risk uh, it's, it's something that becomes a risk on account of your coping abilities, your coping uh, uh, capacity, uh, and also uh, you know how you structure your everyday, uh, your everyday uh, life, and and that was the most significant thing uh, to me, which led me to actually to the view that um, um, the assumption that's being made in sociology uh, about there uh, being. Uh, risk societies and uh, societies that live in uncertainty may be a problematic one uh, because actually every society in order to function uh, needs to have some kind or some notion uh, of risk and you find that notion of risk uh, in the kinds of things uh, that people do in order to be able to go on doing things uh, so uh, you know for 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 the peasants that i was talking to uh, in southern mozambique uh, uh, the most important thing for them uh, was always to be in a position uh, uh, to to be in control of their lives uh, right so uh, a disaster situation happens when they lose uh, all possibility of being in control uh, uh, of their lives so, um, because this is a long story, what I may uh, try to do is uh, uh, to uh, draw at least one implication uh, that I see as far as the corona pandemic uh, is concerned. Okay. Because what you see, uh, what we see is that uh, we are being confronted uh, with measures to deal with corona that correspond actually uh, to how certain countries uh, perceive corona as a disaster, as a risk, right? Uh, and so uh, it's, it's almost as if uh, African societies, in the way that they are responding, a lot of them with the lockdown measures, uh, they were actually uh, responding to corona the way uh, uh, you know the way that Europeans defined Corona as a problem, not the way that Africans themselves are defining Corona as a problem. So here in Europe and in in other developed countries or parts of the world, uh, the major issue uh, with Corona uh, is uh, that it can overwhelm the uh, health infrastructure. So you know this flattening of the curve. Uh, has to do with making sure that the health infrastructure is not overwhelmed. Correct. Right? This is what they want to do. Now, when you lock down in Africa, what do you want to do? Considering the fact uh, that the health infrastructure uh, is not, uh, <laughs> it's not the first address uh, for most of the people, uh, you know, when they, they have a, uh, when they have a problem, mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, right? So, uh, uh, so, 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 so you see here, uh, we are dealing with a, a problem that is a universal one. It's a global problem, but we are dealing with this problem uh, in the language of one particular place uh, mm -hmm. of Europe. Uh, uh, and Asia, and we are not dealing it with, uh, you know, uh, in our own language. We are not approaching Corona, uh, you know, the way that we should be approaching it, you know, locally uh, through our own uh, conceptualization uh, uh, of Corona. How, uh, just, just to um, interrupt you, uh, how uh, you know? I'd be interested, interested to hear how. Um, it would be expressed in in, our, uh, in 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 the African language, shall, shall we say, yeah. in the African context, and how different would it be? This the issue that you're raising is one that has been um, discussed quite um, extensively in this short time, yeah. where uh, in Kenya, in fact, there are those who reject the term social distancing. Right. They, they say it is physical distancing. Um, we are not really capable 
of of yeah. social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> Africa, right. Africa's really, um, but but I'll be very keen to to sort of um, uh, put coronavirus through uh, your African lens and and okay. see what would be different if 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 we were implementing measures to deal with it um, that aren't just templates of what the Chinese and the Europeans have done. Yeah, okay, so perhaps two things there. One is that, uh, well, it wouldn't be social distancing or physical distancing in the way that it is being understood here. Mm -hmm. But this is not cultural. Uh, it's not because we Africans uh, cannot live uh, without contact with other people. Mm -hmm. Because the reason why we need this contact, and this is very important, there is a structural one. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, we are forced by circumstances uh, to seek uh, 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 contact with other people. Uh, you know, you, you, we have all these informal networks, uh, we have to maintain these informal networks, we have to maintain our relationship with our extended family and so on, uh, because in most countries, um, you know, even in Kenya, where you, you do have a strong social policy establishment, uh, even in places like Kenya, uh, you still need the support of your next of kin to survive, uh, yeah. right? You, you just cannot do without uh, that. So there is a structural reason why, uh, you know, social distancing uh, is a problem for Africans, not just a cultural uh, uh, reason. But this also means uh, then uh, that uh, if you want to respond uh, to a pandemic, uh, you do not weaken uh, that which helps people, uh, you know, uh, protect themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, by enforcing social distancing or physical distancing measures, you are actually weakening that institution uh, that would be there to help people. And that seems to me quite irresponsible. Mm -hmm. That's, it's a narrative which is gaining currency from academics such as yourselves. And, um, and I'll be, I want to tease out a bit more uh, yeah, okay. for, for you. And I know I'm asking you to also be a bit speculative here. Um, what would a more appropriate response in the case of Mozambique or Kenya look like yeah. compared, to, yeah. compared to Switzerland where you are at this yeah. current time? What would, be, what would be a more um, appropriate um, yeah. response given... Um, um, yes you know, those structural issues that you've uh, yes, that, described in our societies? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, actually, the model to follow in Africa yeah. is the Sw uh, Swedish model. Okay. Yeah, that's the, that's the model uh, to follow. Uh, you know, what the Swedes uh, decided to do was not to lock down. Yeah. Uh, and uh, although uh, they do not say it openly, uh, actually, uh, they are committed uh, to something uh, that in public health and epidemiology is known as herd immunity. Uh, something uh, that was tried in Britain uh, at the beginning of the pandemic uh, by Boris Johnson, uh, and then uh, he chickened out of it uh, when uh, uh, a study was published a paper was published at Imperial College by Niall uh, uh, mm -hmm. Ferguson, uh, you know, basically painting a, a, a horror, uh, uh, if you like, uh, uh, scenario uh, to come uh, if uh, social distancing measures were not taken, uh, right? And so he chickened out uh, and uh, he went back to what most European countries are doing. The only country that uh, remained st steadfast was uh, Sweden. Mm -hmm. So wh what Sweden did was to say, uh, look, uh, this, is, this is basically a flu. It's a severe form uh, uh, of a flu. We know what flus are like. We have had this before. We know that they claim a lot of lives. And so, um, you know, because we have uh, no cure for this, that is, we're basically because we do not have a vaccine uh, for this and we are not likely to have one in the next 18 months, the best thing to do then is, on the one hand, to protect the vulnerable. Yes. Uh, 
and and the vulnerable are basically uh, older people yes. uh, you know if you if you look at the death uh, statistics uh, everywhere what you will find is that basically 80 to 90 percent of uh, the people uh, whose lives were claimed by this pandemic were older people yeah this was the problem in italy it was the problem uh, also uh, uh, in Spain. It's slightly different in New York, uh, you know, where it's, it has affected a lot of African Americans yeah. uh, of a younger age, uh, but there is a strong connection there also uh, to uh, the quality of the health uh, uh, infrastructure. So, okay, um, so this idea of a herd uh, immunity, uh, um, plays an important role uh, in the policies that were taken uh, by Sweden. And th that, that policy seems to be working, right? And so this is the model which a lot of African countries should have followed for several reasons. One reason is that we do not have a health infrastructure to protect. Yeah. yeah? Uh, the second reason is that uh, uh, there is no vaccine. And there's no prospect of a vaccine in the next few months. So uh, if you go into lockdown, right, then in Africa, uh, uh, you know, uh, social distancing, avoiding infection uh, becomes actually the policy to deal with this, uh, right? In Europe, the social distancing is not a way of dealing with the pandemic. It is a way of protecting the health infrastructure you know so people afterwards uh, can get infected and they can go to hospital right now which hospital are you going to go to when you get infected in africa uh, you know in the absence of a vaccine what you have to do then is to stay in permanent lockdown uh, for at least two uh, 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 two years or, or something while you wait for the vaccine uh, uh, to come so it would make sense actually uh, in the context of africa uh, to go for a careful and measured uh, policy of encouraging herd immunity so you make sure that those who need protection are protected. Uh, you make sure uh, that you have a very good system of controlling uh, potential uh, hazards, uh, you know, so people traveling and so on. Um, and uh, you do not destroy your economic and social infrastructure. Uh, the way that a lot of African countries are doing uh, now. Uh, so that uh, it's almost like uh, the cure uh, is worse uh, uh, than, than, than the disease itself, right? Um, thank you very much. Um, the, the, the very concept of herd immunity is quite controversial, uh, uh, Prof, uh, because uh, I think, um, uh, there are certain assumptions that seem to underlie it, which uh, some people find distasteful to even consider, which is the fact that we accept that we are going to lose a certain percentage of the population. Yeah. And, uh, and who, who will that be? And, yeah. and I've seen interviews with the chief epi epidemiologist in yeah. Sweden several times, and he's very careful uh, in the way he does he, he doesn't even like the word uh, herd immunity. Yeah. But he's quite articulate in, in yeah. making an argument that is not dissimilar from yours. Yeah. Um, of course, um, um, we are informed by um, the, you know, uh, by the capacity that our regimes across Africa have the, have to analyze and to respond. And so these templates fit very quickly. We saw the company uh, McKinsey hired by some governments very quickly to do research, which was quite um, a slightly absurd thing to do, but it showed you the, that the, uh, the crisis of imagination is worse than the pandemic. Uh, amongst those who are making the choices and decisions. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and it's one of the reasons the elephant is doing a, a COVID series with okay. academics, African right. academics, uh, right. even in America, the African-American Af academics say, hold on, we have 
for past 30 years been pushed aside, uh, alienated, pushed into exile, called all our academics dissidents, and, and um, now we are stuck. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> people like Elisio Makamo are in Switzerland at the University of Basel, <laughs> not in Maputo. <laughs> So this, this, I think, is part of our challenge. I, I, yeah. I really believe um, that some of the kind of thinking that you're putting on the table uh, is, isn't happening. But um, how do you respond to those who yeah. say, because uh, quite close to, to us here in, 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 in East Africa, in Tanzania, yeah. um, the government uh, has, has opted for, uh, it, it's not so articulated, so we're not yeah, yeah. completely clear what policy it is, but from the outside, it looks like that. Yeah, uh, uh, the herd immunity approach, which yeah. which uh, the the Swedes seem to have gone for, um, in that um, there are no uh, you know hugely aggressive lockdowns. Um, you know, try to maintain social uh, social life, um, and 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 that kind of thing. Um, People are mesmerized by the potential pictures of the potential uh, calamity yeah. that will arise if we go for herd immunity. There is yeah. this, and I think uh, there's Mr. Mr. Bill Gates and his wife Melissa Gates mm -hmm. have been quite vocal that uh, yeah. in Africa there shall be bodies on the side of the road and etc. Yeah. Et and this, uh, of course, is uh, we, we know that uh, they, they said. I mean. People like them said this about uh, HIV AIDS. Uh, they said this about Ebola, yeah. uh, the last, uh, the last uh, Ebola crisis in, in, in West Africa. Uh, did not claim, uh, uh, not even a half of the lives that uh, uh, COVID-19 has claimed uh, now uh, worldwide. Uh, right, uh, and 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 the the, the scenarios uh, we're talking of two million people dying in Africa because of uh, of, of Ebola. So uh, okay, but uh, let me say three things, uh, John. Uh, yeah. One, uh, uh, one is look, I do not blame any African government that decides uh, uh, to uh, go, um, you know, to take these lockdown measures. It's a very difficult political decision to take, uh, you know, because it's lives at stake. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and so you don't want to risk anything. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I have full sympathy for those African governments, including the government of my own country, that, that go for a policy of lockdown, uh, right? Because this is not an easy political decision uh, to take. You don't want to be the, the president or the government uh, who is responsible for the loss, loss of a lot of lives. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, uh, and, and this uh, uh, has something to do with, with the case in Tanzania. I mean, what I hear from Tanzania uh, uh, is uh, actually not quite uh, clear. Uh, it seems uh, that they do not seem to be taking the issue seriously, you know. Now that's different uh, from uh, from what Sweden is doing, right? So this uh, this comes to me uh, uh, comes across to me like uh, what uh, Trump uh, uh, did in the U.S., what Bolsonaro is doing uh, in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So. Basically, yeah, not taking the issue uh, seriously. I, I, I seem to, I, I remember that at one point, uh, the president in Tanzania advised people to pray. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. So, so you see, this, this is, this is, a, uh, this is a very strange uh, attitude uh, towards uh, uh, the pandemic. But uh, the issue is that uh, uh, the science. Uh, behind uh, COVID-19 does not give us uh, any clear recommendations, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, it is really uh, up uh, to people who are uh, not experts in public health, and this is the, the case with politicians, uh, who are not experts on epidemiology, 
uh, and virology uh, to take decisions from what science knows about corona. Yeah, but what science knows about corona is very little and it is very controversial. So what do you do? So any decision that you take uh, is going to be a, a decision taken under uncertainty, right? And so actually, if you look uh, closely at what governments have been doing, uh, what you find is not the ideal situation where science informs policy, uh, but what you have is a situation where a political decision is taken and then politicians go out and look for the science that will uh, give legitimacy to that pol uh, political decision, you know? So th these are uh, times of uncertainty that we are uh, going uh, uh, through. So that, that was my second point. Uh, the science on this is not, uh, is not as clear as uh, we think uh, uh, it is. And that's why you have people doing what they're doing in Sweden and you have people doing what they're doing in the rest uh, uh, of Europe. So the US, Tanzania and Brazil, uh, these are completely different cases. So th these are cases of people who apparently do not take the issue seriously. Right. So th that brings me to the ethical, to the very difficult ethical issue that you raised. Uh, and uh, and it is it, it is difficult because we are talking about human lives. Uh, you know, whatever decision we take here is likely uh, to cost us uh, uh, human lives. Now, the lockdown measures uh, in Europe they have one advantage, uh, given uh, also the economic financial stability of these countries. Uh, the advantage that these measures have uh, is that they will indeed save lives, clearly, right? Uh, they will save lives. Uh, how many lives uh, uh, in, in, in compared to the number of lives which are lost every year because of respiratory diseases? That's another issue, right? Um, there are people, and uh, I have no expertise on these issues, but there are people uh, who would argue that that will not make much of a difference. You know, so at the end of the day, we will just have a case of a severe uh, uh, flu, oh, right? But, you know, that's controversial. Now, um, uh, in Africa, this is not the situation. No. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the dilemma we face is of losing many lives and protecting our social and economic infrastructure, right? So that's one. And the other side of the dilemma is losing many lives without protecting our economic and social infrastructure. Yeah. So what do we do? Right? right? So what should a country like Mozambique do under the circumstances? Uh, look, uh, with these lockdown measures, we have already lost 12,000 jobs, Yeah. right? 12,000 jobs. We have the tourist, tourism sector, which employs 60,000 people. You know, it's not working. So 60,000 people are going to lose their jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no prospect of uh, recovering, you know, because you don't know when you're going to open up. Uh, right, and so the 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 consequences, uh, you know, uh, if a push comes to shove, uh, and uh, the pandemic hits us uh, seriously, you'll have a lot of people dying of the uh, uh, pandemic, and then afterwards you'll have people dying of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the 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 economic hardship. So the measures that we are taking, it's so much. I, I like to put it in this way, uh, we are committing suicide uh, because we fear death, right? Yeah. This is what we're doing. Mm. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the ethical issue is a serious one, uh, but uh, the situation requires us to take uh, 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 pragmatic decisions. And uh, you, you see, uh, the, 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 the concept of herd immunity does not really mean uh, that you should let people die. Uh, it means uh, you should uh, have people inoculated, you know, 
this is a natural vaccine, right? Uh, and so, because it's not the case uh, that everybody who is infected dies. Uh, this is not the case. I mean, there's no deaths in Mozambique. Okay, uh, it's only 80 people, but there are no deaths in Mozambique. There are no deaths in, in Madagascar. I don't know about Kenya, uh, uh, right? And then, uh, you know, we need to look at uh, who is dying, uh, right? And uh, so far, uh, uh, the reported deaths in Africa, uh, you know, uh, are of older people, just like in Italy, uh, just like uh, uh, just like in Spain. So you can protect those people, uh, right? Um, so it's not like you're saying, okay, let many people die. You're saying let many people get infected because those people are the ones who are going uh, uh, to stop the spread of the disease. You know, the more people who are infected, uh, the less, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, the slower the rate of infection is going uh, to be. And, and then, you know, afterwards we will all uh, uh, be fine. And I mean, at the beginning, people were saying you needed, you know, like 60% uh, uh, infections uh, 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 in the country. But now uh, they have revised that down, uh, depending on the circumstances, to 20%. Right. So, so you know, there is science here also, uh, uh, you know, behind this. Uh, uh, we we know, for example, and 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 this is uh, uh, okay. There, there are people, there are there are Africans saying, yeah, well, maybe we have some kind of natural protection against this or the heat and so on. Maybe these things play a, a, a role, and we should take them seriously. Uh, but we know uh, that uh, this uh, uh, this um, uh, uh, virus. Uh, is not uh, 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 wreaking the same kind of havoc uh, that it wreaked in other countries, uh, right? So there's something there which we should explore. That is a, that. Uh, th thank you for that answer. It's it's um, it's it's been a controversial subject, and you've come out extremely clearly clearly on it. Um, one one final question, uh, Professor. Uh, and for you to put your, your professor's hat on and give, <laughs> given 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 your, your, your you know your, your experience uh, in studying people's responses to disasters um, um, in 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 Africa, uh, what would you speculate would be some of um, the 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 more negative uh, effects that will emerge out of this coronavirus and the entire regime of measures that has been implemented to deal with it, and what potentially could be some of the positive uh, developments uh, that could emerge out of this experience? Because, uh, as 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 you have said, you know, in 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 your book, extreme situations. Uh, with, 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 with even with great destructive potential, uh, you know, can produce you know meaningful individual uh, and social lives. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a very very important uh, question. Uh, let me start with what I hope to be the positive uh, outcomes. Uh, you know, uh, these measures. Uh, the lockdown measures, uh, what they actually do, or, or what they show us is, is that we need uh, public intervention and public policies uh, that uh, make uh, or that, uh, uh, you know, encourage us to lead, uh, you know, normal lives, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, in Mozambique, there are restrictions on the number of people you can carry on, on public transport, you know, but those restrictions actually correspond to what should be normal. Yes. <laughs> right uh, and so and uh, and that's and that's the logic uh, behind this uh, so uh, what i hope to be a positive uh, effect of this uh, is that uh, people learn to appreciate normal life uh, right you know and, and and people actually also cultivate uh, uh, that uh, right now uh, uh, okay uh, of course i hope uh, 
uh, that governments uh, will also become more responsible, that they will be uh, more aware uh, of uh, why it is important uh, to have uh, good uh, public health uh, systems. Uh, because uh, uh, the good thing about crisis uh, is that they always reveal our weaknesses. Uh, because crisis hit us, you know, where we are weak right uh, so we have an opportunity to see where we are weak and then we can do something uh, uh, about that uh, so the, the negative uh, outcomes of this uh, would be if no lessons uh, were uh, were derived uh, from the whole uh, experience um, and uh, i don't think that that will be the case uh, actually uh, uh, you know, I think what we take to be, uh, you know, African life uh, will will be strengthened. Uh, people will come to appreciate uh, the importance uh, uh, of uh, of social proximity. <laughs> um, um, you know, uh, the importance uh, of uh, uh, you know maintaining uh, good social networks, uh, and uh, uh, so I think that will uh, will be even more. Uh, encouraged uh, uh, because of this uh, terrible experience. Uh, Professor Elisio Makamo, uh, thank you, thank you very, very much for speaking to the elephant this morning. That was a very, very stimulating and insightful uh, discussion we've had with some uh, very profound insights uh, from yourself. So we, if you don't mind, I'll be coming back to you. Okay. <laughs> uh, because it, it, it looks as if we will be in this for some time. And yeah. I, I look forward to maybe reviewing the situation in a, in a, few, in a few weeks' time. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.